through the motions, um, living a, a lifeless religion. And I'll be referring to a lot of stuff I talked about on Sunday night. Um, I know a lot of you guys weren't here, uh, but I'll try to go over some of that. Uh, in that teaching, we talked about uh, routine, uh, repetition, and ritual. And we uh, looked at uh, how easy it is for us to become creatures of habit. Even, uh, you know, coming to church every week, we all, well, not all of us, but for the most part, we like to sit in the same seats. We have the same parking spots. It's just little things like that that we don't even think about. We do the same thing uh, from week to week, though. Oh, wow. Taking advantage. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, I remember uh, from VBS, one of the little boys, he accepted God into his heart and he was so pumped up. He was coming to church and he seemed excited. But then after a week or two, he just kind of, I'm not sure what he what his home life is like, but he just kind of lost that, and he doesn't come as much anymore, and it really makes me sad, but um, you know, all I can do is just reach out to him every week and, and keep doing what we're doing. But um, what about uh, this example here? We, we talked about, this is what we talked about last week, fresh new start. But what about if we think about driving a car? We talked about... Um, you know, Paul talks about setting our minds and fixing our eyes on, on the prize. Um, and I'm going to do this now. I wasn't planning on it. but If you can imagine with me, this rope is a timeline of your life. Marianne, I know you've heard this already, but imagine this rope just goes on forever and ever, and this is a timeline of your life, okay? And then this little part right here, the colored part, is your time here on earth. And how many of us get so caught up in this little part right here, where, you know, we, we think, I'm going to do this, I'm going to decide to do this now, because when I get here, that's going to make it really good, right? Just save up all my money, and when I get to be like 80 years old, I'm just going to relax, I'm going to go live in the Bahamas, and, you know, just take it easy. But it's so easy to, to look at this and, you know, get caught up in making decisions for this and just totally ignore all of this, right? So people in the world will look at us like we're crazy, you know, if we uh, are not caught up in money and, and the things that the world enjoys, the, the pleasures, but we look at the world as being crazy because, you know, they're ignoring all this. They're caught up in, in all that stuff that really doesn't mean anything once we pass the point from here to here, you know, and we jump from this life to eternal life. And the Bible teaches us that what we do in this little part here is going to affect all of this. So... I wanted to share with that with you now because we're going to talk about it more as we get into our lesson here. But it's easy to, to get distracted, you know. We Even just looking up in the rearview mirror, looking back at the past, for a split second can totally sidetrack you and sideswipe you and take you all off course. And even aside from looking in the rearview mirror, we have all the distractions off to the side, the bright, shiny objects, the, the bulletin boards. It only takes a split second, though, to, to totally mess up your travel. And one little mistake could be deadly. And the same thing with this example here. If we take our eyes off the prize and put our eyes on things that the world has to offer, it can totally mess us up. So also to... We didn't talk about this last Sunday night, but imagine with me 
you're driving the same route every day. And sometimes, at least for me, especially when I'm tired, you know, you can kind of zone out and become like a zombie. At least that's how I felt at times, especially when I worked at the airport. I'd get up at 2 in the morning. So usually by the end of my shift around noontime, I was usually pretty tired. And, you know, I'd roll down the windows trying to keep myself alert and awake. But when you drive the same road every day, it's easy for your mind to just wander off and to uh, just not even, you're like, it's like you're here, but you're really not here. It's like your mind is somewhere else. And I remember one time when I was driving home and I was really tired. And that happened to me. I was zoned out. And before I knew it, I was like swerving off the road. And like my eyes were open, but it's like I just came back to my senses and I realized that, wow, I'm driving a car and my car is going off the road. And very quickly I had to swerve back on the road. You know, if I, if I didn't wake up, it could have not been pretty. But uh, I use that example because uh, we're talking about going through the motions today. And how many of us come here every week and it can feel like that? You know, we're here, but we're really not here. Um, so I want to talk to you about religion. Uh, you always hear, you know, contemporary Christian theology, uh, religion versus relationship. But what does that word religion mean? Can anybody define it for me? Kind of like rituals. Right. Yeah. So you think about religion, you think of the Pharisees, right? They're all caught up in tradition and their customs. You know, but their hearts were kind of messed up. They were caught up in all these actions, but then it, while they were doing the actions, they were hurting people and uh, regarding them as dogs and stuff like that. But last last Sunday night we talked about um, religion versus relationship a little bit. And we talked about, you know, how we can t look at examples from everyday life and compare it to our relationship with God. Um, I was referring to my wife quite often, you know, uh, we're celebrating our, I proposed to her on this day five years ago and, uh, little island in the Philippines and so it's amazing how four years being together and being married you know we we looked at how much alike we were becoming like each other just little things little phrases that we we say we kind of steal from each other and it's kind of weird even it might sound a little weird to you guys but even our I noticed like our eyes you know, they say the eyes are the window to the soul. It seems like over time, we're kind of, like our faces are changing a little bit to be more like each other a little bit. It's kind of weird. But I was thinking about that with God. And, you know, I think the more time we spend with God, the more we become like him. And so... Before we dive in, let's look at what the word religion 
actually means in the, in the dictionary. It says, the service and worship of God or the supernatural, a commitment or devotion to religious faith or observance, a personal set or institutionalized system of religious attitudes, beliefs, and practices, and then archaic scrupulous conformity, big words. Uh, number four, a cause, principle, or system of beliefs held to with ardor and faith. So that gives you just a quick picture of what the word religion means. Um, but what are some of the requirements for a relationship that you guys can think of? Two-sided? Commitment, yep. What's that? Agree, yep. When I was uh, just kind of dwelling on that, what I wrote down here is engagement. You know, we have to communicate with each other. There should be some desire for each other, right? Um, effort and time. Um, humans tend to, to find a lot of comfort in ritual. I was thinking of when I was a little boy. My family used to travel to Utica to visit some of our extended family. And whenever we, we went out there, I would not be able to fall asleep because it was a different setting. You know, I was very comfortable with my bed at home, you know. But when you go somewhere else, somewhere you're not comfortable, um, it can tend to throw you off track a little bit, you know, catch you off guard, and it's hard to, for in, in that case, to fall asleep. But what about um, ritual in terms of our relationship with God? Is it, um, is it okay to have, like, set times of prayer? What's that? So if I talk to my wife only in the morning, in the, the lunchtime, and at dinner, is that okay? Right. <laughs> how, about, how about to take it one step further? How about if I only talk to God when I need something? And they have to face a certain direction. Yeah. So, so we also sp spoke a little bit about um, desire in the relationship. Uh, we, uh, we asked if we should read the Bible if we don't feel like it. So I always felt like, me personally, I felt in my own heart that, you know, if I'm coming to God and I don't want to really be with him, then I'm not going to come at all. I used to say to myself, I'm not going to read my Bible because my my passion and my desire is not really there. You know, I want to be real in God's eyes. I want to desire him in those times when I come to him. What can you guys say about that? I found if I read the Bible when I really don't want to read it, I go to the Lord something else, then I knew it was not for him. He took away from my time and his time. Okay. I, I have the experience of personally sometimes I call on a friend for Thank you, Lord. And I feel like the Lord, I don't want to pray. I'm not going to pray for him. 
and some people just don't like to read, you know. I happen to be one of those people. I'm a very visual type person. I like learning from like visual aids and it just really helps me to learn, you know. And uh, But um, as I began to, to look into that and to study, I began to see that my attitude was actually wrong because, you know, I talked a little bit with my wife about this, this topic this week, and I asked her, you know, how would you feel if I came to you and you knew that I really didn't want to talk to you, say I was upset or angry, and you knew that my heart wasn't into talking to you. You know, sometimes, you know, I feel when people come to me and I know that they don't want to talk to me, it's like, just don't come and talk to me then, you know. Don't waste my time. I can tell you really don't want to talk to me. So, But she said, I asked her, and she said, yes, she does want me to talk to her. And that kind of took me, it kind of blew me away because, um, you know, that's kind of like being a disciple. Sometimes, even when you're not in the mood, if you're not feeling like it, um, God still wants us to come to him, even if we're a little upset, a little angry. God wants us to talk to him. And I just looked at what my wife said, and, you know, that I think that's how God is. You know, God really desires us. And when I thought about it myself, you know, when my wife is upset at me, you know, I want her to, to talk to me as well. Like, I don't want her to be quiet, and then there's, like, all this tension in the room because we're not talking to each other. Um, you know, I think God really does want us to come to him and talk to him in those times. Uh, we're going to look at some verses here. And we're going to look at, um, these are uh, Bible verses that we could use to support uh, the use of ritual or custom in terms of relationship. You know, certain times, certain places. So the first one is from Mark 10. And this one says, Getting up, he went from there to the region of Judea, and beyond the Jordan, crowds gathered around him again. And according to his custom, he once more began to teach them, referring to Jesus. So he had a custom where he would go and teach them. That's that one there. Next one is Luke 4. It says, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. So that's another custom that we see, something that they would do from year to year or on the Sabbath. Uh, let's see. Next one is Luke 22. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, his disciples followed him. So we can see that that was something that he did uh, frequently. Uh, next one is Acts 17. According, This is about Paul. According to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. Next one is Luke 5. This is what Jesus would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. And the last one here, Mark 14. And he went away and prayed, saying the same words. Does anybody know what that's referring to? It's not in the context where it would give you, but can anybody think of what that might be from? Yeah, yeah, it's when he prayed three times, take this cup from me. We'll talk more about that. Um, so from those examples, we can see prayer patterns. We can see teaching patter patterns. We can see location patterns. There's also other verses where we see Jesus going up into a mountain to pray. Uh, now let's look at some passages 
that might say that rituals are not okay. The first one is Galatians 4. It says, But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. So you can see that has the, uh, it's kind of like holidays, you know, type of thing. Okay, next one is Mark 7. It says, he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And this is continuing, Mark 7. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. This was talking in reference to when the Pharisees were condemning them for not washing their hands. Um, so we have that condemnation, but God is looking at the heart issue here that's going on. Okay, then we have Colossians 2. It says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow, hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So with this one, we see that the focus is being directed off of Christ. Oops. Okay, so from all those passages, we can see that um, these passages are saying that when rituals take your attention from the eternal to the temporal, that's not good. When rituals violate God's law and God's nature, that's not good. And also, to go along with that one, when we make our own law that's not in alignment with God's nature, that's another thing that could not be good. And then lastly, those that distract from Christ. Okay, so what are some things, or so, some signs that you could possibly be living a, a lifeless religion that you could think of? What are some signs that you're living a lifeless religion? You're just going through the motions. So like you're here, but you're really not here type of thing? Yeah. Okay, anything else? <laughs> like a double life? Yeah. Any other things that might point to someone being like fake or going through the motions that you can think of? I tried to come up with a list. This is what I came up with. You know, if you're feeling empty inside, um, possibly tired or worn out, that can be the same for, for true Christians as well, but... Um, maybe even more so for someone who's in the environment of Christianity but not living according to the ways of Christianity when they go outside of the four walls of the church type of thing. Uh, lack of expectancy. Maybe you come here and you just, uh, you're comfortable. You're not expecting anything different 
from week to week. Uh, maybe your desire for the reading the Word has kind of decreased over the years. That could be another sign. Uh, maybe your desire to come to church from week to week, maybe that's not as strong. Maybe your desire to serve, maybe that's gone down a little bit. Maybe your, your desire for prayer, maybe, you know, you're not having spiritual conversations with people outside of church, maybe the only spiritual conversations you're having are with people inside the church. And the majority of your time, where is the majority of your time going? Is it going on activities that, you know, pleasure, feel-good activities, enjoyment, fun, or are you, you devoting your time to God? You know, maybe you see the Bible as being a little bit boring. That could be another sign. And this is a big one. Uh, you know, sin could be excused. You know, I'm, you could say, oh, I'm, I'm a sinner. That's okay, you know. And maybe you just kind of minimize holiness a little bit. And then... Uh, you know, I put down emotionalism and super spiritualism. You know, trying to make things happen that aren't really there. Um, do I need to explain that one? Okay, it's... Uh, for example, someone coming up and asking for prayer, say your arm is hurting, and then someone prays for you, and then you declare to the whole church that my arm is healed, you know, maybe it never really hurt that bad in the first place, maybe it was just kind of like a little pain and now it's not, you know, we could kind of exaggerate things to, to make it seem like God is really at work, but maybe it's just us trying to make it seem that way type of thing. That's where I was going with that. Um, and then a lack of application of what we hear every Sunday. You know, we be doers of the word, not just hearers type of thing. So going through the motions, or if we, to be more specific, routine and ritual and repetition, it doesn't always mean that someone's heart isn't in it. I have a picture, a couple pictures here, taking out the trash, cleaning the house, putting the toilet seat down. These are all things that, in a relationship, they're realities. They're things that you do for your loved one that necessarily you don't really feel like doing, but in order to show that you love them, you're going to do it anyways. And I know you guys want to be authentic. You want to be real. So what is a real relationship? I'll go back to our definition here. Religion. Uh, let's see. I'm pretty far. There it is. Service and worship of God or the su supernatural. Um, if you go down to number two, personal set or institutionalized system of religious attitudes, beliefs, or practices. 
could even be number four, a cause, principle, or system of beliefs. So, Yeah, good one. So, so in in a relationship, like every day, there's routines that we do. But we already talked about relationships require you know like engagement, desire, effort, and time. But part of that effort is sacrifice, right? You have to sacrifice what you want for the other person. So true love requires great sacrifice. Think of what Jesus did for us, right? So a question to ask is, do you enjoy discipline? Do you enjoy being a disciple? Do you really enjoy it, or is it kind of like a burden to you? Uh, last Sunday night, we talked about values versus feelings. And we talked about how Christian value should always uh, overtake our feelings. Sometimes the more important thing is for holding on to those Christian values rather than what we feel like doing what's comfortable for us type of thing. And we also talked about if if you could imagine the consequences of living a life totally based on feelings. Um, if you could think of, uh, you know, staying true to a spouse or working, going to, to put food on the table for your family. That's not something that feels good, but you do it because you love your family. Uh, disciplining children, that's not always an easy thing that that feels good, but you have to do it because you love your child. But uh, isn't it true that Christ uh, most likely didn't feel like bearing the cross for us? You know, he prayed three times. He asked God the Father if he could, if the cup could pass from him. It's not a pleasant thing to get crucified on a cross. Um, Let's look at this passage here from Luke. It says, Jesus said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it and begin, or all who observe it will begin to ridicule him, saying, "This man began to build and was not able to finish." Therefore, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his own possessions. So from this passage, we can ask a number of questions. We can, uh, first, first thing, we have to look at the word hate. That word hate is simply, um, if you can think of value. Are you putting God at the top of your list? The second question we could ask is, are you going to be able to start or are you going to be able to finish what you start? You can see I underlined it there, the, the example of the one who uh, laid the foundation. And the next question we can ask is, can one have possessions and still at the same time not letting those possessions own you? Is that, is that okay? Why do you say no, Jim? Is it possible to have a beautiful car with, without right. letting it own you, though? Yeah, so it's, 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 
Right. Okay, uh, what are some of the requirements that you can think of for a disciple? Lead by example. Lead by example. Well, it's kind of a disciple is kind of like a follower. So, commitment. Right? Put down a recognition of God's fathership. Recognize that God loves you. Who would really want to be a disciple and follow Jesus if they didn't feel Jesus' love towards them, right? Um, you have to have a humble heart, a heart that's uh, willing to be corrected. Uh, eternal priorities overtake temporal. You know, you think of the disciples, they all left everything. They left their whole life and left everything to follow him. And then, lastly, a lack of pride. You know, you don't, you don't know everything. You don't have all the answers. We looked at this passage last Sunday night. The hidden joy of discipline. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but rather painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for all of those who have been trained by it. It's such a powerful passage. You can think of the athlete who's training. You know, that doesn't feel good, but then when he's standing on the pedestal holding up his award at the end, what a great feeling that is, right? Right, no pain, no gain. I like that. So how do you revive the desire Maybe that desire is just not there for, for you as strong as it was when you first accepted God into your heart. Maybe that desire for prayer, the desire to, to spend time in the Word, you know, just getting a cup of coffee in the morning and flipping open and just digging, you know, just having such a hunger and thirst. How do you revive that desire if it, it's not as strong? Prayer, yeah. Yeah, sometimes you need to just you need to you need to push through it, you know. There can be a point where you feel like God that's enough. And I've often thought if I push through that, then I get to the the drumming part of the drill. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just it's you just feel it. Yeah. Perseverance, yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of glad you said that because the next thing I wrote down here is, I mean, we've talked about this here today. Hopefully it's encouraged you guys, but really there's nothing that I can say or do to put that desire in your heart because it's a personal relationship with you and God. It's a relationship between you and him, and that's it. So I want to encourage you guys don't always rely on what I, I have to say or whoever is up here has to say. Go home, flip open the Bible, study for yourself. There's so much to know. There's so much to learn. You know, I, I feel that so, so many people every Sunday just come to churches and they just put all their trust on who, whoever's up on the platform speaking. You know, I could be saying something that's wrong. I'm not perfect. Uh, Hold me accountable when I get up here and teach. You know, I want to be saying the right thing. If I say something wrong, please stop me and let me know because it's very important to me. But, um, you know, we all should just have such a hunger and thirst for, for the word. Like the Bereans, like Mary said on Sunday night, they, they went home and they studied what Paul was saying. They, they dug and they wanted to find out if what he was saying was true. And... Uh, if I could think of, if I could offer you one suggestion in terms of reviving that, that passion. Uh, today, my wife and I are going to go on a date for our, 
our fifth year of when I proposed to her. So go on a date with God. You know, set a, a, a date and a time and a place, just you and him, maybe a cup of coffee. And just flip open and have time with God. You know, pray, talk to God, spend time with God, and just enjoy. Enjoy the goodness of the Word of God and being in His presence. Thank you.